Well, hello, and thanks for joining us for another Wednesday chat. I'm going to begin a series on 1 Peter. So let's start by who is the author. Well, it's Peter. It says so in 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. There's really no dispute among the authorship of Peter for this letter. Even among more liberal scholars, the, the early church, it's widely attested and held to that Peter wrote this. Actually, he was dictating it to Silvanus or Silas, his secretary, in 512. But Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. We have a good idea that it was Silas or Silvanus who actually did the writing because the Greek is very good, one of the best in the New Testament. The date for the letter is sometime during the reign of Nero. He reigned from 54 to 68 AD. Peter uses the term Babylon to refer to Rome in 513. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings and so does Mark, my son. He wrote the letter from Rome, probably between the years of 62 to 64, somewhere in there. And we're certain that he was crucified by Nero upside down in 67 AD. What's the occasion and theme for the letter? To persevere in the faith while suffering. He says Christ's example is for us. And how he suffered, we will suffer. So it's a very pastoral letter by Peter to encourage Christians who are undergoing persecution. The setting is it's written to Gentiles in the northern part of Asia Minor, which today would be Turkey. John's seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation was also in Asia Minor. There was a lot of persecution there. It wasn't uh, empire-wide in this time period, but it was in certain places, and it seemed like Asia Minor was a place. There was a lot of emperor worship, and when you did not do that, you were severely persecuted. Now, on the day of Pentecost, there were countries and regions mentioned. Let me read Acts 2.9. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. Same ones that were mentioned at verse 1. So Jews from these places of northern Asia Minor came to Jerusalem on Pentecost. They were present. Some of them undoubtedly got saved, took the gospel back to their cities, and churches were formed. So Peter is writing to those churches that were probably born shortly after the day of Pentecost. 2.10 and 4.30 shows that he was also writing to Gentiles. Let me read that. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And 4.3 says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So those two verses also confirm his audience was not Jews, but Gentiles. So this first section of 1 Peter 1, I'm calling Good News for Discouraged Believers. Have you ever been discouraged? Well, I have. And we probably all have from time to time. I'll always remember this scene in a TV show called Northern Alaska, where a demon was talking to the Eskimo Ed, interestingly enough, his name was Ed, that he said, I'm going to make you so discouraged, you won't be able to get off your chair. Discouragement is contagious. And when we're around discouraged people, it tends to bring us down. But the truth is, it is a curable dis-ease. It isn't cured by circumstances changing because they may not. And if our circumstances change, we get happy. If they change back again, we go to being sad again. So that's no way to live on that yo-yo. The only lasting cure for discouragement is the Word of God, to renew our minds in the truth of Scripture. Peter, in what follows here in the first part of chapter 1, mentions three doctrinal truths that will encourage us when we're discouraged. We need to remember them and rely on them. We'll look at the first one next week.
there's so much insight onto why we think and do what we do if we go back to the source of two trees in the Garden of Eden, dispelled by tasting of the forbidden tree of knowledge of good and evil, no goods in there, and by that great fall for humankind, we lost the opportunity to taste the bliss of eternal God life he would want from us, for us, from partaking of the tree of life. That life we missed at that point so huge, it has resulted in everything we have found ourselves craving. A vast void has left our value system in our own hands to form, to figure out the value of good and evil based on things that aren't life-giving. We're limited to our five senses, responses from our surrounding world that accept or reject us, the image we put on for surviving, how to get by, thoughts and actions, good and bad feelings, all this without the tree of life informing us. Can we imagine how prey we are then to anything that bolsters our significance and acceptance. Ed and I just mentioned the other day, you know, the first or second or third time a little toddler girl hears, you're pretty. We're actually forming a path for her that she's probably going to have to deal with regarding her identity. We become tailor-made selves to this. So when this new self is gained, through believing on Jesus Christ, there's more than we realize. There's a newness that finally fills that void. It's a new nature of Christ through the person of the indwelling Holy Spirit. As we're told by the prophets, out with the heart of stone and in with the new heart. Here, we're changed to the very core, our core identity. We find all the significance, love, and acceptance we have craved, and it's been found in God all along. We're born into eternal life and living. Once we've tasted of this, we will never be the same. But at some point, we realize we're not as used to tasting of life as we are to these previously made, tailor-made program selves. So this new start is added to the, uh, with the new start that's added is that we fully want to please God. But again, we're not used to being led by the Spirit, so we tend to revert to the program selves to try to please God, which keeps us at the center, our efforts, according to the good side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How hard and elusive it would be and is to discern what's our good trying and what's of the Spirit. This is where Hebrews 4 makes sense. For the Word of God is living and active. As Ed said, um, it encourages the discouraged, the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We really need the word of God. So it's not now so hard to figure out what, what ails Christians is much the same disorders as its surrounding world. And it's sometimes worse because the bar of righteousness and achievement has been set to a new height. Now we are left with achievement and performance-based Christianity as we see it. As Christians, our lack of knowing what it is to be in Christ keeps our guilt and condemnation fever, feverishly aiming to meet the bar of God's and other Christians' acceptance. And this becomes our greatest challenge to growth in Jesus Christ. It keeps, again, us as still the center <clears throat> of the focus of what we're doing. I remember Thomas Merton saying that many of us are merely a people who watch ourselves live. Well, that's death, not life. What can peel our eyes off ourselves to Christ saying it is finished? With this understanding taking more hold, a friend, Jeremy Chambers, sent <clears throat> some of what I'm gonna quote from Luke 10. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from lightning from heaven. 
Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So what follows is a series of Jeremy's quotes intermingled. Can you imagine the intoxicating joy at seeing these sorts of results? Well, I know I seem wired when I see some works and results I can remember just going to bed with adrenaline just pumping through me mesmerized that God would use me so I truly understand this being the reaction of the disciples but Jesus knew this whole makeup of our bent and had a further admonition so exceedingly glad at the fruit of their ministry Jesus seems more than happy about it too Jeremy says but then he gives that insight, word of caution, don't simply rejoice because demons are fleeing, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is a good shepherd. He doesn't want distraction by the results of good work. Rather, he wants them to remember the foundation of all their joy. The Father has given salvation to them. He is bringing the focus away from the doing of ministry and back to the reality of identity. They are saved so this being saved is done by another other than ourselves so Jesus response in the passage so shows that he also shares in the excitement of their their results yet his wisdom guides them away from addictive drug dangerous greed of achievement that can creep into our souls Jesus warns us not to get our identity from accomplishments but return to the foundation of all joy of salvation he cautions disciples not to lose sight of this. Jesus knows how easy it is for us who serve to get caught up in serving and forget the big picture. That no matter what you have accomplished, if you never see Christ is a true source of joy and satisfaction, then no amount of achievement will seem right to you. Jesus warns his followers from becoming consumed by doing good things and missing out on the best thing. If the results of your ministry become falsely foundational to your joy, then posi positive results will destroy your humility and negative results will crush your soul and willpower to go on. This is also insightful. So this very line <clears throat> had risen off the page and has been so helpful to me. Jesus wants you to find your rejoicing not in the doing of his work, but in his work for you. Ephesians 1 and the King James says, for you, us word, insight to see his power toward us, us word who believe. It attracts our focus of seeing and glory totally on what's been done by another. Your joy is founded in him and his beautiful, loving work and saving you and bringing you into his family. Rejoice in the work done for you looking at the source Jesus the doer attracts the soul's attention thou just keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee I, I love this idea but where's the magnet to make it an attraction to Jesus I know attraction is something we make friends with we set our affections on in Colossians 3 I hear, though, this magnet attracting David when at his lowest point and in his confession, he clearly knows what to ask and what he needed. Um, Psalms 51.10. I mean, there's so much of this is purely God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, for my transgressions and my sin are ever before me. Purge me. With hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Can we hear all the clothing of God's work upon David here? He could go out and we could, can face our world clothed with all this. A right spirit, joy of salvation, hearing joy and gladness. This is all that sums up in emotionally whole mental health. So this is going to seem off the wall, but a scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark has come back to me in different applications. 
I don't know if any of you remember it, but a dual scene unfolds when you have these feverish sword swings from this expert, expert swordsman dressed in total black with a red belt, many feet in front of Indiana Jones, showing off all his impressive swings and threats. Indiana Jones, having watched all this, just pulls out his gun and shoots him. So the gun in this scene, wow, introduces a whole other arsenal of weaponry than impressive swings of a sword many feet away. Analogy stands for our own sweating efforts to measure up, yet silenced immediately by that bullet from the transcending arsenal. It's that look at the cross where Jesus says, it is finished and I love you and died for you. I love you undresses you. Try it. It shuts it down all done even while we were yet sinners. I wish all of us, including myself, could land our soul's attraction of a lifetime and inform, be informed by this now between now and our even next set of actions, our daily activities to be seen completed, already completed in the righteousness of Jesus, a right spirit and flowing from the tree of life, led by the spirit, where the burden is light and his commandments aren't cumbersome, doing works already prepared for us beforehand. This is all just to be in pace with who we already are. Hebrews says, let the soul grow strong on grace. Okay, so there are some scriptures that I have newly found that start off with the right focus and then what happens from us for Samuel 12 24 only and I'm just going to rattle through them only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart for consider what great things he's done for you he is your praise he is your God he has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen Joshua 23 3 and you have seen all that the Lord has done has done to all these nations for your sake it's the Lord, your God, who has fought for you. And then certainly the inward cleansing is mentioned in Ezekiel. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart, also called a one heart, heart of flesh, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone, the removal of the old stony, unreceptive heart. Satan is dispossessed. The stony heart is taken away. The enmity is slain. The old man is put down from his throne and put off from his deeds. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. The almighty spirit of the indwelling God writes his laws on the new heart and inclines it to a life of obedience, regeneration, transformation of the man into another man. His grace is implanted. His image is stamped on and principles of light and life of grace and holiness are put, the understanding is enlightened, the will is subdued, the affections are set on these things, and the mind and conscience are cleansed and purified. I will cause them to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my commands. The verse even before this is if you go word by word and just see all the action in them, um, Ezekiel 36, 25. Going word by word, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I actually think we see the answer. This is the answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I will that also thou, who, those whom you have given me, be with me where I am, and that they behold my glory. We are created and meant to be watching him and what he's done for us. So here we're placed. We naturally want to be on the cutting edge, seeing the action happen through us. But maybe we'll be told like the Gadarene who so much wanted to join Jesus. Jesus did not permit it but said, return to, return to your home, to your friends, and declare how much God has done for you and how, much he, how he has had mercy on you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So notice the focusing. 
So at the end of David's confession, this comes full circle. O oh Lord, open my mouth, and my mouth will declare your praise, like the demoniac, or the delivered demoniac. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. Yes, we're only too happy to give something we can watch. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. So in my soul, I see a great hope for a Christian culture that comes into this understanding. It's his inward movements by his immeasurable greatness of his power. Isn't this the plot and drama our souls have been created to be captivated by? Focus on the eternal and boundless resourcing that never ends, not our own works. Our lifetime now redirected with the delight of putting Jesus on center stage because for us, our names are written in heaven. Mm, let's pray. Well, Lord, that's good news. And all we can say to it is thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We couldn't earn it ourselves. We don't deserve it. But you give it freely of your great grace. I pray that we will ponder your word and its truth and it would really change us in jesus name amen